powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios Red Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from down under outside Brisbane, Australia. It's episode nine of Primetime Jukebox. Tonight, it's our Cheap Tricks show, as we are proud to welcome band founder Rick Nielsen and his son Aaron, as we talk Cheap Trick and a whole lot more. And as always, Primetime Jukebox is sponsored by Perdomo Cigars. Awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigar is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double H 12-Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Abano Bourbon Barrel Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, visit the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Drew Estate, Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for all the primetime network of shows is sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Jukebox Episode 9. We're recording our first show for the month of May. This is Will Cooper. I'm on the red stage in the Perdomo Cigar Studios, and I'm joined down under by my friend and colleague, Mr. Dave Burke. Hey, Will. How's it going? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We got an exciting night uh, tonight. I think we should just dive right into it, Dave. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk to Aaron and Rick yep, about all yep. things uh, music. Yeah, so we want to welcome in uh, first um, the the founder um, of Cheap Trick, the one and only uh, legend in the industry, Mr. Rick Nielsen, and Good his morning. son Aaron. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, and and welcome. We do really appreciate you making this time for us um, as well, but uh, for both of you guys. So thank you guys so much for being a part of this. It's the only time I ever get to see my son. <laughs> where, where are you based out of uh, rick right now i'm in uh, rockford illinois okay all right so you're i'm not... at home my wife's in uh, scottsdale Woo! so there so so that's good <laughs> yeah yeah there you go but i've been yeah. alone here at the house uh since uh for over a month and a half all right i don't know if that's good or bad but uh <laughs> it's good and bad yeah exactly exactly but uh, no, we really do appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know we're all smoking stuff tonight. Um, so why don't we, uh, Rick? What are you smoking? I've got uh, some uh, Cohiba. Let me get my box here. Oh, it breaks out the good stuff. Beautiful. It's usually uh, robustos, but I couldn't find them the last time. Very, very. So, uh, very nice. And you're smoking and you're able to, you're smoking in the house. That's a good thing. Yeah, nobody's who's gonna tell me no. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No. An awesome choice. Um Aaron, what are you smoking? Um, I have got the Byron. So um ah. breaking that out this tonight for this occasion. There you go. Uh Dave, what are you smoking? I've got the Undercrown the Shady. So the box pressed uh, torpedo. There you go, a little music connection there. That's right. Yep, yep. Um, and I'm smoking, and this was a very. I, I wanted to five, find something with the five neck guitar. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I had a little trouble, right? So I came up with the Diamond Crown uh, Maduro because it's the 125th anniversary of Jay Z Newman, the company that makes it, and I just figured there's a five at the end of it, and multiples of five, and I tried hard. I, I tried for a warhead five dave i'm out of them so oh yeah so right. that was the one i was thinking of yeah and I, I, had, I had no more leave of v's either so those are the other two i was looking at and i've worked with dolly parton so there you go oh, there you go. go okay you got your dolly parton connection dave in every episode there is a um there is a dolly parton connection uh to date in the show because of dave what what uh what did you work with her on i worked uh, at uh um at uh, capital records 
uh, we were doing, uh, actually it was Charo and, and Dolly came in, the Coochie Coochie. And uh, everybody, I, I have some pictures with everybody wearing pink, uh, pink glasses. Right. And I was working with uh, Glenn Campbell at the same time. Oh. They were all kind of friends. Oh, wow. I worked with Glenn on his last two records. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I, I, I've always liked Glenn Campbell. I remember my mom used to listen to it, and I kind of never outgrew it. But yeah, the, uh, um, yeah, so no, we, uh, we, like I said, we definitely appreciate you being a part of the show. Rick, I got, I got this a question right up front. How did the whole thing with the five neck guitar start? Well, I started using, uh, I wish I could get to my computer and show you pictures of all this stuff, which I do have. Um, I used to uh, pile guitars one on top of another, you know, and then I'd do a solo and I'd throw one away and then I'd throw one away. And it's like, I thought, that idea is stupid enough. Let's, how about another stupid idea? And um, I was actually going to have uh, six necks and have it spin like a roulette wheel. And then Billy Gibbons... <laughs> And his easy top came out. He had he had, you know, oh. one neck. So you know, so I wasn't going to copy that. But I thought well, everybody's going to think I'm copying him. And I didn't have a beard, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's great. That's that's great. how it started. And then uh, I actually have three of them. Right. You know, one one stupid enough. So get three. You know, get re ridiculous. <laughs> They're very yeah, hard to play. Although you guys could probably do it. <laughs> You have a pretty extensive guitar collection. Yes, I do. You? If you want, I could walk in the other room and show you some stuff because I, I don't have anybody to talk to here, so I started uh, going in my vaults and bringing stuff out. <laughs> well, yeah, go ahead. I mean, Aaron, were you just like growing up? Were you just tripping over guitars all the time? Uh, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> they were definitely around. Um, not that I really paid attention. I mean, it, it's one of those things where. Um, when you're born with no musical talent whatsoever, um, they, it kind of becomes like, what is this thing doing here? So uh, I, I definitely saw the collection from time to time. And actually when, you know, um, I'll go back to my, my folks place, um, you know, once, once in a while we'll go down to the vault and kind of see what he's got in there. Um, he's got, I don't know where he went, but you know, I think we lost back, him. I don't know. I think he's getting the guitars out. Yeah. yeah. So when, um, so he, he's got a lot at the house and then he's got, um, which he won't be able to take you to, but he's got a studio off the house where he records right. and writes and does different things. And, um, from, I think it was because of insurance purposes, he's got to have them in a, a gun safe. So he's got this huge gun. All right. Huge, but it's a, it's a gun safe where he's got, I don't know, probably six or seven. Uh, there you go, Pop. Oh, here's some guitars. There you go. It laid out. Um, yeah, it's six or seven in the the gun vault, and then the rest are in kind of this big area. I guess he's got like 400 or 500, so I can't – I can never Jeez. keep track. Wow. Oh, so you got some guitars out for us. Hey, can you see them? Oh wow. oh wow! Look at that. Uh, it's pretty rare stuff here. Uh, the one starting on the left. It's a '58 uh, uh, Gibson Explorer. They only made 19 of them, and I have three. The last one that sold was a million one, but I didn't pay that for it. And uh, then a '58 Flying V, then an '82 Flying V, then a. Uh, uh, Futura, two moderns, and if you look, just got a lot of stuff. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's amazing! Oh wow, said, it's just wow! Get, it's like a six million dollar couch. I said, yeah. I know my wife wastes money, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> e exactly! Wow, wow! I think I got cut off there halfway walking in the room. That's okay. Yeah, you probably enjoy that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that is beautiful. That's, I mean, it, this is works of art. Uh, wow. When you look at guitars, I went to a store in Vegas called Ed Roman. Uh, I know. Him. Yeah, yeah. I just went and like, not that I I don't play guitar, but I just wanted to go see all the guitars that were there. And I just got these too. Oh wow! They're one quarter size miniatures yeah. made in France. Oh wow! Took me a year and a half to get them. 
They don't wow. play really well. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any, like, I guess, special guitars or guitars that are special to you because of where you played them or anything? Well, I do in my vault. I have a guitar that I gave to John Lennon when I worked on the Double Fantasy record. Wow. And I got it, and I got it back from Yoko three years after he was murdered. Wow. Wow. Well, that's pretty rare. Yeah. yeah otherwise, it's that? kind of a normal guitar, but otherwise, the fact that uh, I still have the strings, I wanted to get John's uh, DNA. <laughs> what? So how did how did, did you just, did he just need a guitar and you gave him one, or how did that work? Well, <clears throat> actually, it was the day that uh, my third son, Dax, was born, and I, uh, it was a secret session, went to New York, and... Uh, He'd never seen the guitar that I had. It was, a, it was a Fender Telecaster with a string bender on it. Kind of weird thing. He says, oh, wow, that's cool. I said, well, I'm going to uh, Japan as soon as I go see my son for a day. And, uh, and I saw Aaron, too. And, uh, <laughs> and so I said, here, you just keep it. I don't need it. I'm not taking it to Japan with me. So wow. Because I actually had a guitar made for him which is at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. All right. Yeah. Hey, at least wow. you, uh, for that one, um, you know, you, I, I've heard the story because, um, well, multiple times about uh, the left-handed Les Paul that you gave to Paul McCartney mm -hmm. so I could be born. Oop, oops. I don't know if the return on, in, return on investment is <laughs> really paid off for you. <laughs> it's only worth like a million bucks. I mean, who cares, right? Yeah, hey. Yeah, he still owes me money. <laughs> Near Paul. Aaron and Paul. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, you got to collect, Rick. You got to collect on that. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm, uh, I love my son too much to, you know, to borrow his wallet. <laughs> Rick, I got to ask you a question here. Um, was your first record label with CBS Records? Yeah, I was on, uh, I was on Epic Records in 1968, actually. Okay. With the oh. not with cheap trick, but it's okay. Tom, the bass player, and myself, mm. okay, and three other guys. So and, uh, it went nowhere. Okay. We were produced by Jackie Mills, who produced uh, Bobby Sherman yeah. and a bunch of other stuff, and he also uh, produced uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Telly Savalas. Oh wow! You've heard the album; it's called Telly Like It Is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So that record went nowhere, and then after that, uh, my wife and I, we went to end up living in Europe for a while, and came back in 73, and we went, lived in Philadelphia, and then uh, Aaron was uh, in, the, in the hopper, as they say. We had zero money, uh, so I drove back to Illinois, but that was right after I sold one of my guitars to a guy named Paul Hamer, which then ended up starting Hamer Guitars. So Aaron owes me t money too. Yep, That's story of my life. <laughs> we didn't have any insurance, so I sold the guitar, and that was the start. That was the seed money for Hamer Guitars. Oh, oh wow! Yeah. Oh wow! So my uh, the, my my family has a slight connection to CBS Records. Uh, my grandfather was a driver for uh, a person by the name of Ron Alexenberg. He was a driver. Knew, Ron. He was yeah. one of the guys that signed us. Yeah, that's why I, I wanted to ask that. Um, so my grandfather was the driver for him. He went with Ron to Infinity Records, and then my dad took over for uh, his replacement, Don Dempsey. Oh, so, I knew Don, too. Yeah. Yeah, and Don was like uh, – Don, Don and my dad were very close for a long time, um, even after he uh, – I wish I knew all this stuff. I'd have some pictures to send them to you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, uh, I mean, and I'll tell you, I used to get the demo records. Uh, Don and Ron Alexa, they give us demo records, and that's how I, I actually had the, I had Cheap Trick record. Uh, I had the Budokan thing, I think, before anyone else. I had a demo copy of the record. We'll give it back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, there was a, at the Black Rock. Yeah, 52nd. 52 West 52nd Street. Yep, yep, mm. yep. So I mean, uh, you know, I knew I knew the Walter Yetnikoffs and those guys. Like my dad, when I was a kid, I would just remember seeing all those guys. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. So no, that's it. We went there after the Budokan when it came out. You know, we we hardly sold any records, uh, but that one took off, and uh, it was Lenny. Um, oh, Lenny. Uh, let's see, let's see. 
PT, oh, Luxembourg, PT, he was there PT Lenny PT. Lenny PT, right. He, he gave each one of us a check for 10 grand. Mm. <laughs> wow. Whoa, Danny. <laughs> Yeah, Lenny, Lenny lived up in Stanford, Connecticut, and I know uh, sometimes my dad would, would let me come along, and uh, I know we'd pick up Lenny, and they'd drive him into New York. We were living in New York City, and he'd drive up to Connecticut, pick up Lenny, and then go into New York. Mm. Cool. Well, I lived with uh, Jack Douglas. Oh, wow. Our first record in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, next door to uh, Yogi Berra. All right. <laughs> And there was a White Castle down the street, which we didn't have in the Midwest. So I thought, this is the perfect place. Yogi Berra, <laughs> White Castle. Holy yeah, God. right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Dave, I'll let Who's you cut it. Big cigar smokers, uh, Jack Douglas. Oh, I didn't, that right. I didn't know. That I didn't know. Wow. Yeah. Um, he produced Aerosmith. He produced the John Lennon. He produced mm. Cheap Trick's first record. He mixed uh, Live at Budokan with, with me. We just did something uh, for, for Sirius Radio, too. Right. That's great. David All right. Boyd. Hey, Pop, I've got a, I've got that picture of you with uh, Todd Rundgren. I, I've seen that. It's on the oh. wall downstairs. So you, I remember yeah. seeing that picture of you guys smoking together. Smoking at our house. Wow. That's awesome. That is just awesome. I mean, what, what, Rick, what was that? And Aaron, too. What was that time like during Live at Budokan when that album got so huge? And because you're talking about before putting out, you know, records earlier and then Live at Budokan came out and really sold really well. I mean, what was that like going from the earlier records to the to the Budokan era? Well, we just worked all the time. So it's like uh, I tell people we never stopped to smell the roses. Right. Like, we had a big hit and we were in Europe with nobody heard it. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, hey, don't you, you know, in uh in Chicago and Boston, we're doing great. So what? <laughs> so we, we just always toured. I would tell people if if we had to uh, wait till have a hit record to tour, we, we'd never tour. Yeah. So we just kept going. But it was great. You know, the, you know, we got our first gold record in Japan in 1978. You know, yesterday was the, or two days ago, was our mm. second show at Budokan. It was April 30th, yeah. 1978, where, where that stuff came from. And so we got our first gold record over there because we had a hit from our second record over there, not in the States. It didn't do mm. anything, but we were number one there. We beat Queen and Kiss. Oh, wow. And I rubbed it into them because we worked with them. <laughs> we, we, we did a tour with, uh, we started the tour with Queen uh, because Thin Lizzy didn't show up. We did right. two shows. We did Madison, Wisconsin. And, yeah. And Milwaukee. And the press were there from Japan to see Queen, not to see us, but they liked us. And they asked if I would write what it was like ha hanging around with Queen. What, what, yeah, okay. <laughs> so nice offer. And be, right, starting then, and then later that same year, we did three months with Kiss. It was the same right. thing. The Japanese press was there to see them, but they liked us. And we, that really made us take off in Japan. Right. Well, what was it like? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, what was it like trying to keep up that tour schedule? Because that just sounds brutal. We used, we used to do 300 shows a year, so it was taking it easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Aaron. Uh, this is your dad. You never saw me from growing up. Not too much. Milk carton. Uh, uh, yeah, sir, so good. Dave, wait, I'm frozen. It's always good. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Mm. Somebody, if you turn the camera on or off, it will it will work. But yeah. Yeah. Talking to me? Not, no, you're fine. Uh, it was Aaron. You're fine. But how did you like with such a tour schedule? How did you sort of keep it fresh and avoid from from burning out on tour? Well, we're. I still to this day I feel like I'm lucky. I get to do what I like. You know, the traveling kind of blows, but uh, I love to play. And every show, you know, they're up. It's always a new audience, so you gotta, you can't rest on your laurels from last night or whatever. So you just always try to make it fresh, and good. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Uh, sorry, I got cut off there. So, um, you know, Dave, you had asked me the question. So, you know, growing up, we grew. Um, so we're from Rockford, Illinois. You know, so yeah. I don't know, forty-five minutes west of O'Hare. And so, growing up, I mean, we were in a 
well, I guess it'd be a two story house. And we were on the top floor. My uncle was on the, the floor below. I didn't know anything. You're a kid, right? So you don't, I mean, you have no concept of really anything other than, you know, your, who your parents are, et cetera. And then I remember my mom and I were at the window of the house and this semi, uh, I guess, truck with a, a flatbed comes with this green 50, what was it, Pop? 56 T-Bird? 56. 56 T-Bird. And my mom's like, I wonder who that's for. I'm like, they give it to her. And then not that long after that, we moved from this, you know, two bedroom upstairs of this house to this 10,000 square foot home. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Pretty good, you know, change of residency. And so it was, you know, it was obviously a, a, a big change in that regards from, um, you know, where we were to where we were, you know, moving forward. But in first grade, I think ish, when Budokan came out, um, but I would just lie to my, my friends. I, I told everybody my dad was a principal. <laughs> I'm like, my dad's a principal. Like, no, he's not. I'm like, hey, yeah, you know, he's, so I, you know, that was my, you know, as a kid, what do you know? You, but uh, yeah, so that was what it was like kind of early on. It's so funny because there's probably a lot of kids whose dads are principals that lie and say they're rock stars. <laughs> right, <know>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh. I'm in rock band. I have no principles. <laughs> it, it's just, just, and I was talking to Will about this too, but it's an interesting break for a band because usually bands might have like a really big studio record and then people look for the live stuff. But Cheap Trick was almost opposite in the sense that like you broke really big with that live record and it catapulted a lot of the studio stuff. Well, the live was what we were, you know, it's like, People, mm. if they saw us, like opening for whoever we opened for, it's like, oh yeah, that those guys. Our record, except for our first record, the second, third, and maybe the f fourth, we're all, we were always toned down. And you know, like we'd make the record and it sound pretty good, and then we'd take off and they'd mix it. You know the old story: checks in the mail, or we'll fix it when when we mix it. Right, right, right. And one time I was in L.A. and I flew home got off the plane and I said, I called the studio. So let me hear what you did. It, I hated what I heard over the phone. I got back on the plane and went back without even going home. Mm. Cause they'd done the wrong thing. No wonder I didn't see eyes. you. Remember, no wonder I didn't see you that night. <laughs> <laughs> Rick was the there. First, what Aaron talked about that first house we had, that was my first house with my wife. We rented uh, the other, mm. The bottom half, and and Tom Peterson's parent or grandparents lived mm -hmm. there. He was a baker. He's like ninety years old, then. and Karen and I lived upstairs. And before you knew it, we started having these kids. And, uh, Aaron, Aaron was born in, in seventy three. That's uh, and we lived there until seventy eight. And then I I've always liked architecture, and and I looked and we found this house built in eighteen fifty four. It was a, uh, you know, it was. 10,000 square feet, 2 million bricks. And I love, you know, I love the architecture of it, but it was kind of wrecked. So I got mm. a, a fairly decent price on it. It had 28 rooms and we started rehabbing it. And you know, the movie, The Money Pit? It was oh, yeah. on our place, <laughs> but it was cool. It was an underground railroad and Clarence Darrow shot pool there. It was like, it's, it was great oh. history. Oh wow! Yeah. Then when we uh, recorded with uh, with uh, uh, George Martin down in uh, Montserrat, doing the All Shook Up record, mm. the house we had an electrical fire in the place, and it burned about a hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. Oh and, wow! But it was the same day that Bon Scott died, and it's like I could care oh, less wow. about her house. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Loved Bon. He was going to sing on some stuff with me. I took him to his first uh, Mexican restaurant. Oh, he had really? Tacos oh. and scotch. Nice. Tacos and scotch. <laughs> That's great. Good but, combo. Yeah. Well, it is in Australia. Bon Scott, that whole era of ACDC, is sort of like icon here. Yeah. Well, we played on that uh, the street, uh, ACDC Street. You know, I think it's is it in Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah, it's ACD, yeah, ACDC Lane, yeah. Yeah, I said, you know, I tried to emigrate to Australia 
uh, earlier, about 1973, before we had uh, kids, we had a dog, and they wouldn't let me in because of the quarantine. So I said that if, if I had gone, I'd be in uh, uh, ACDC right now, except I'm too tall. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, so Rick, you know, how did the live album get the airplay here? I mean, because I know back then, like, like charted, charted albums or charted records, the airplay was a big factor. How did the, how did the airplay piece start on radio uh, for you guys here? Well, let's see. When Budokan came out in, in Japan, it was Lenny Collins. He worked for Epic. And he took it to uh, WBCN in, in Boston. And they started playing it and playing it and playing it. He said, you can't get this record. And that's, and it was kind of a hit in Boston. Uh, and then it just spread to the rest of the United States. Yeah, I mean, I mean just remember. And then there was payola too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we never paid enough, I guess. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. We just kept touring. We toured with Kansas in Europe. We toured with the Kinks. We toured... Uh, like I said, with Queen, with Kiss, and uh, with Rush, we did all kinds of. And we oh. also did oh, wow. like a couple months with AC/DC flip flop mm -hmm. shows. And if you read uh, one of the AC/DC books, they said it was a every night they had their best game on because because we were tough to follow. <laughs> like <laughs> like they're impossible to follow, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's I had. Uh, 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 Malcolm and Angus came over to the, the apartment where we lived and went to the, the new house that we were rehabbing. Mm. They came to uh, Rockford the day before. It was the 4th of July, 1979. We played. We had 40,000 people outside of town with ACDC and us. And they came over. And then the last tour before Malcolm died, I was, went to Madison, Wisconsin. No, I was in Nashville. Yeah. I flew down to Nashville. And... Uh, I go in the dressing room, all, all these country stars with, you know, trying to get in there. And it's like, they, they didn't let anybody in except me. And, and I walked in, <laughs> walk in the dressing room, Angus says, you still live in the Rockford? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. And I saw him uh, in LA uh, last year at, uh, I was sitting in a Chinese restaurant. He came in, we got some good pictures together. Hmm. Oh man, that's awesome. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I was just thinking, like Aaron, and thinking of like you know, how, talking about your dad going to school. Would it be like friends, like, oh, you know, what'd you do? Oh, you know, my dad and I, uh, I don't know, fixed up the the back veranda. How about you? Like, oh, my dad brought ACDC over and we hung out. And <laughs> how was that? Well. You know, you don't really, again, so probably the question I get asked the most, um, you know, for obviously people back in Rockford and, you know, growing up still in the same town, some people that I've been friends with for years, you know, it, it, it obviously never comes out. But people kind of meet me for the first time or when we do a conversation like this is always, you know, what's it like growing up, you know, in that environment of, you know, having your dad and a musician, et cetera. And my response is always, you know, I, I don't know any different, right? So I never mm. knew any different than what it was involved. But I remember, you know, meeting Gene Simmons or, you know, all the way from like guys in Alabama to, mm. um, you know, uh, Paige Plant. Um, mm. Wow. You know, so I, we didn't, you know, I, you know, and you try to have a conversation with somebody, they're not going to be able to relate in that regard, right? So it's, you no. know, again, their dad's a principal, unlike mine. <laughs> <laughs> and so they can, you know, talk about those kind of things. But, you know, growing up, my dad, he was gone all the time. So, you know, when he was talking about Montserrat, I remember living there as a kid, you know, I remember George Martin and living on the island. Um, mm -hmm. And we lived in LA for a little while. So, but, you know, and then you get older, you're in school and you don't, you know, you don't go on the bus anymore. You know, I'm going on a tour with my dad a lot um, on the bus. What and, about your birthday party? <laughs> Tom got me, yeah. So the bass player, Tom, go. got me a, a stripper. We were in L.A. <laughs> and and uh, Tom got a stripper, although I, I think she could bench press me. She was very, she was not like a stripper that I remember. It was, she was like, she was muscle bound. And, uh, <laughs> tied me up, yeah. So, were, were you 14? 
Uh, I was four, 14 in LA. Yeah. No, uh, 14, 15, yeah. <laughs> why not? Who doesn't give a four Tom, you know, who, who doesn't, who doesn't give a stripper to a 14 year old for their birthday? That's a, yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah, I didn't do it, but I didn't, uh, I yeah. didn't say no. Yeah. I, you weren't, you didn't uh, leave the room or you didn't have uh, your hands <laughs> over. You didn't have a uh, blindfold on. I right. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. The uh, so, uh, Aaron, did you you know you obviously you knew you're close with the other band members like Tom and Robin. Yeah, so I, I am. Um, so Tom, I, you know, so I think Coop, we talked about this a little bit. So I'm the, I guess technically the oldest of all the lineage, if you will, the the, the kids of the band, and right. so mm-hmm. I was, you know, I've got pictures of Tom holding me. In fact, in my house, I've got a picture of of Tom holding me when I had to be about three months old. So, um, you know, I've got, I grew up with them, you know, they're kind of like part of family in, in some regards. I mean, because, you know, my dad will probably attest. I mean, he probably spends, you know, over the years probably spent more time with them than he did the family. So when I was like, well, you better. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, so I, I, yeah, so I, you know, I got to know Tom and Robin, you know, very well. And, um, you know, we don't talk all that often. I text with Tom every once in a while, Robin, but, um, you know, when I see him, it's just like family. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking that too, like, uh, Rick, for you being around, I mean, the band since the beginning, like, wh- I guess, what, what is it in a band that, that for you, like helps it work? Like what, what did, what did you guys have? that because so many bands start out and maybe put an album or an EP together and then fold. I mean, what do you think cheap trick had that kept it, kept it going and, and kept putting the music out? Well, we were together all the time, but we didn't socialize outside of the band too much. Right. You know, like everybody had their own, had a real life and we never tried to be something that we weren't, you know, it's like, I never tried to dress up like my mom with hairspray and, and put a cucumber <laughs> down my pants right. like, like a lot of the bands did. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, in, like was, when I was growing up, I was always the kind of the, the class clown. I, you know, not like I grew up thinking that's what I wanted to do, but, you know, if I liked the teacher, I did really well. If I didn't like the teacher, I thought I was smarter than the teacher. Oh. I did awful. You know, I was thrown out of the Rockford uh, school system uh, music program in seventh grade for life. <laughs> and my, oh, wow. my, my parents owned a music store which <laughs> dealt with, with all the uh, band instruments and, and band directors from the whole area. It was quite a big store. And it's like in seventh grade, you know, I used to travel with my father because he was an opera singer too. Mm. And I could, I, I knew the wrong notes when I heard him. You know, it's like, I, I All right. Didn't know yeah. what I was listening to, but I knew if they made a goof, and I would, I would go up to the his uh, piano player, who was kind of a real straight laced guy, and say, "Hey, Jim, you made a mistake in the fourth <laughs> night." It's like Ugh. he was like get so flustered. So I knew music fairly well, and so in seventh grade, I was first chair, flute, and drums. And, oh wow! Uh, and halfway through, uh, the the semester, I went up to the band director and I said Mr. Bischel you're an incompetent drunken fool who doesn't deserve to teach music to me or anybody else boom I was thrown out right there I don't know why wow <laughs> wow he, and 40 years later I was uh, inducted with uh, Dr. Timothy Johnson who was the ABC doctor on TV and and and, uh, and what's his name John B. Anderson, who ran for president from Rock. I remember him, yeah. He was at the same school. And I said, what do you have me here for? For <laughs> levity or whatever? And, and the principal of that school, who I thought was ancient when I went there in junior high school, he was right. able to say, I thought he'd been dead 100 years. <laughs> he comes up to me, Rick, you were right. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> in seventh grade, that was the last time I ever told the truth. So I got in trouble for it. Wow. I, I was right. My, by then, my parents had passed away. So, hey, mom and dad, see? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, I was right. It wasn't me. It wasn't. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, you can't make up jumps like that. 
No. no, no. And I went to college and I had 59 credits. You needed 60 to graduate. And I said, what do I care? Oh. I'm a musician. I don't need this. Stuff. <laughs> 15 years later, they gave me a, a credit I'll, in music. There you go. I'll go ask that. Aaron was a proud day for Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, you know what? Let's, well, Let's talk about Aaron. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, Rick. Though it's still amazing, though. You know, I'm thinking. You, you, you know, I've grown up with your band. Like I was in sixth grade when I was hearing about you. Aaron was like six years old, and <laughs> forty years later, we're, we're still talking about you know Cheap Trick and people. And there's a whole yeah. new generation that's really excited about cheap trick too i mean how how has that been in terms of what's your reaction in terms of bringing in a lot of those newer fans my, my yeah. sons for example know of you which is a, which they normally we have a complete uh uh generation gap with myself but, but my oldest son a uh, big music fan he, he knew cheap trick right away he's a smart kid yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but other things well, no but <laughs> you know i don't know it's like it's pretty amazing because you know like when i was growing up uh in high school my mother would go to Europe and I'd tell her what records to get, stuff you couldn't get here. So I, have, I had all the early uh, Jimi Hendrix stuff on the European labels, the shiny covers on it and stuff. I had to go search out that stuff to, find, to get the music that was exciting to me. And I think that's what today is. Like a lot of kids, like, you know, you hear, it's all rap, it's all this. It's all, you know, I said, I, I never could have a career. I don't know how to dance. <laughs> but you know it's like so i had to search out this stuff and i think you know jimmy hendrix today sells more records than he did when he was alive yeah and i think it's uh people have you know they they were they're thirsting for what they don't hear on the radio mm. that's that's good it's a good thing yeah i mean are there bands now for both of you rick and Aaron, like are there bands now that that uh, you listen to or, or bands or singers coming out now that that you get interested in well i get uh, like a like a google alert all the time every day there's somebody there's a cheap trick reference every single you know, right. number of them every day this band they sound like cheap trick they, this guy's like that it's like you know it's like or a band that's been around for 100 years it's like to, to still be you know name checked and uh Mm. relevant in in this world and, and it was like like the foo fighters they want to have me play on the record and they and, and open have us play with them and all these other bands it's like what a compliment it's like yeah you know it's like uh when they came to rockford that was like kind of the funny thing we're like in the middle of nowhere and it's like mm -hmm. they'd come to to me not well some i went to go see them or whatever it was like they were instead of going to the Holiday Inn bar, they came to to our house. So I had a bar there too. <laughs> <laughs> Real good one. That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you like? I've heard like I remember very early on, someone told me Cheap Trick is a new wave band, right? Uh, do you guys consider yourself one of the pioneers of new wave, or is, is that even accurate to say you guys a new wave? I don't know. I, I think we're kind of diverse, anyhow. Yeah, and like uh, you know, we're I think we're a power pop, but then we're also, you know, we can do everything. We, yeah. but we do it our own way. We never tried to be something we weren't. We never tried to get real uh, you know, emo kind of stuff, or you know, mm -hmm. like I said, dress up like our mothers, or you know, <laughs> we had too many keyboards on a record. That was the producer's fault. So we worked with some <laughs> of the best people ever. So sorry, Sir, Sir George Martin, when we worked with George and Jeff Emmerich, who also engineered all the Beatle records, they came to uh, the Midwest in mid in the middle of winter to Madison, Wisconsin, to to do the uh, pre-production with us before we went to Montserrat. You don't get George Martin to come to Madison, mm, Wisconsin, yes, no. with two feet of snow. <laughs> he, he didn't need the money that bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So real quick on that, Dave, you were asking me, sorry, I don't know what's going on. I never have bad internet connection. I don't know what's going on. But so, you know, it's interesting because my, you know, my dad was referencing Foo Fighters. So you were asking about bands. You know, I, I was never a music guy. Um, you know, we talked about. 
accustomed to was cheap trick early on. Right. So that was cheap trick mostly when I was growing up and then along came Pearl jam. And for me, right. Pearl jam was like life altering. And I've got a funny story. Um, so my dad knew what a Pearl jam fan I was. So, um, cheap trick was doing, and it's now it's become popular. Um, but cheap trick did four shows in, well, I think it was three shows, three shows, maybe shows in Seattle. Mm. Three and, shows in every major city. Yeah. So they were doing, you know, they do cheap um, trick, cheap trick, then they would do, uh, the new color and then they would do, you know, yeah, Trick. right, 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 right. We're having tonight, whatever it was. So anyway, um, so he knows that he's playing, um, out in Seattle and they're playing a small club called crocodile club. It's out in, out in Seattle. It's a small little venue, probably holds 250 people. Well, Pearl Jam was opening up for them. I mean, so I'm thinking this is Pearl right. Jam, their biggest band in the world, and they're opening up for, for Cheap Trick. So my dad's like, you want to fly out here? You can meet them. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm there. So, so we get out, I get out there, and um, Mike McCready calls my dad. And Mike, which is kind of funny, he went as my dad for Halloween three years in a row. <laughs> so he told me that story when they pick him up so anyway my dad and i get in mike's car and um mike's like hey rick let's go jam and my dad's like i don't jam but fine we'll go to your we'll go to your studio and so we're we're in seattle and you know pearl jam's at its height so i'm in the back seat my dad's in the front and we pull up to this to mike's house it's like this little small little house where he's got his recording studio and this this family is moving they've got a moving truck and everything on the street mike pulls behind kind of by the moving truck and the people are like you can't park here sir you can't park here my dad gets out of the car and the guy's like rick nielsen okay yeah you can park here i'm like <laughs> what the hell just happened like is mike mccready in seattle of pearl jam and they're not letting him park there my dad gets out of the car and um and another story quick from this pop you might remember this so we're in the we're in the car on the way to the first show the, so that was the night before the next night we get in the car, we get picked up by this, this woman picks us up and she ended up owning the crocodile club. And so my dad and I are just kind of making small talk with her and we were just talking about the bands and she's like, um, Oh yeah, my husband's in a band. And I, I'm like, Oh yeah. Who's your, uh, who's your husband? She, he's like, Oh yeah. He's the uh, guitar player for REM. I'm like what? So it's Peter Buck's wife was driving my dad and I over to the crocodile club to watch. Wow. Cheap Trick, or Pearl Jam, open up for Cheap Trick. So then at that point, I became friends, not friends, Eddie Vedder and right. more so Mike McCready. So when I see those guys, you know, I'm still like starstruck, starstruck by them. I don't get starstruck by many people I've met because I was telling Coop when we talked, I have more in common with you guys than I do, you know, Billy Corrigan or Gene Simmons. <laughs> I don't know what to say to it. <laughs> oh, wow. We, paid, we did that thing. It was a three-night three stand. We do each album one night in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Pearl Jam uh, fought to get. I mean, we paid everybody two hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, Eddie Vedder comes up. He goes, "I've never worked for drink tickets. They gave Pearl Jam drink tickets to go to the bar to uh, to get cocktails." <laughs> and Jeff Ahmet looks at Eddie. He's like, "Are we getting paid by drink tickets?" And Eddie's like, "Yeah." I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. Aaron, I yeah, heard he, that Eddie's a cigar guy. I've heard this from a few people. Do you know that? I think what? he is. Yeah, I, he is. Um, I haven't smoked with him, but he does. He does smoke on occasion. Yeah, I've heard he's like. I, that's what I've heard from a few people in the industry, the cigar industry. The guy that uh, is a big cigar smoker. He only smokes the the uh, short story Hemingway, but is Kid Rock who inducted uh, oh. Chief Rick in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, Kid wow. Rock is a big cigar smoker, but he only smokes the uh, the short story. Oh wow. Mm. What? And, what? What? Uh, and the baseball players too, with David Wells and Kurt Gibson. Oh, by the way, big fans. By the way, Pop, I just talked to David two days ago. He he's so David is doing this thing for um, for COVID. He's given tours of his memorabilia at his house, and he's got Babe Ruth's jersey or uniform. He's got, but he's got this guitar wall. So he texted me the other day and says, "Hey, ask your dad if I can have one of the five necks to put put in my collection." I say, yeah, "I'll get right on that." Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, well, David. He's got my poster on the wall there. I think he wants your five neck. I think the poster is no, good, but he wants it. <laughs> he had Babe Ruth's baseball. He had his, his jacket. His, he had the whole thing. I thought, first time I went to see him in Florida when he lived there, I thought we were pulling up to a, a country club. His house was so freaking big. <laughs> so, 
So Rick, what, I mean, we were talking about music, I guess, what are five, five or so records that were really influential to you when you're, when you're like, when you're starting to think of a band, what were some really influential records for you? Oh, well, let's see. I started out as a drummer, so mm. I, I used to like uh, Sandy Nelson and then and, uh, a few things like that, but I actually bought Beatle records before they were famous, not knowing right. who they were. I just liked the record. I have a 45 of the Beatles. And it's like, uh, also, I liked, I liked a lot of uh, kind of bluesy stuff, too. Um, and I, actually, I was a keyboard player uh, on, on some recordings in Chicago at uh, 2120 South Michigan Avenue. All right. We had Chess Records, and uh, I did some stuff there. I, 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 did, I didn't even know who I was playing with. So I was the only, I was the first guy in the United States that had a Mellotron. I bought a Mellotron in England and had it shipped over by boat in 1968. <laughs> yeah, how crazy is that? And uh, and actually, John Lennon. When I worked with him, he had a, he had the same one I did. Uh, but let's see what records. Uh, I liked the, the early. Um, I liked singers. I liked uh, Gene mm. Pitney. Uh, uh, you know, I liked the, the Beatles, the the Who, the Rolling Stones, and uh, I, I had a lot of English records before anybody else did. Right. Uh, uh, Because in 1975, I think it was, or no, in the 60s, uh, uh, in the 60s when I was still in high school, I got Melody Maker by Airmail, which cost 125 bucks a year because I didn't want to wait six weeks to to get issues by boat. And back then the writers were so good that I could visualize, uh, Chris Welsh was one of the writers that I knew, for Melody Maker, you could tell what the bands were like, you know, just by reading it. Right. And I was kind of a, a nut. I, you know. <laughs> Let's talk about Aaron. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I like his story. Well, no, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. Cause I was just thinking too, like when you're talking about putting out your records and you'd come up with something in the studio and then you'd go out and you'd hear back about what they what they did when they mixed it or, or anything that totally changed, I guess. What was that like, that sort of tension between you and producers and, and studio stuff? Well, I actually enjoyed working with most of the guys. Uh, when we did the Dream Police record, um, to do, we had strings in there. And it's like, uh, Tom Worman didn't even come to the studio to do it. You know, it's like, and here I'm directing these guys from the LA Philharmonic and they look at me, well, you know, they zero respect for me. And I'd say, hey, uh, that that's an F sharp you played there, and it's, that's wrong. You know, and they'd like, you know, freak out that this this guy that's wearing a baseball hat and a, whatever knew what, it, what I was talking about. So taking over from that, it was like, this is like cool. And then soon after doing the Dream Police, the, the Budokan came out, but our next record that we actually did after Dream Place was the All Shook Up record with George Martin. You know, George Martin is like, uh, you can't get any better than that. He did the Beatles records. And yeah. Like, and yeah. he music so well. He reminded me of my dad, like a, a more successful uh, <laughs> father. And I went to, you know, I actually went to his house. He got, got wow. blessing from him to do uh, Sergeant Pepper. He cooked for me. Oh, yeah. And wow. when he came to when he came to the United States to do uh, the making of Sergeant Pepper, I was his interpreter. Um, mm. well, he's as deafer than I was, so I was like, so I had to. <laughs> I did in Chicago. I, I was the his uh, right hand man there. <laughs> so, because I mean, I guess you like the Beatles and stuff. We talked about. I like Sorry, the heavier I stuff. I, I saw yeah. I saw the Who in a club. Oh. And I played with the Who in 1968 in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, at the Majestic Hills. It was called. And it's like you know, when I saw them, it was like, oh man, I got to get the same equipment that they do because mm. you know I want to sound like the Who. I said I bought bought the equipment. It's like we ended up sounding like the Guess Who. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess this is for both you and Aaron Rick, but. 
can you just talk us through sort of when you were found out that Cheap Trick was going in the Hall of Fame? I mean, what what was that like? I guess for both of you, like what was what was that experience like? Well, we were we were eligible for about twelve years. Yeah. It's like when we started, there was no Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was like you know the Golf Hall, Hall of Fame, or football. So I never <laughs> even thought about it. You know, it's like, well, then these guys get in. It's like, uh, well, <laughs> we're cheap trick. We'll never get in there. You know, they want. But then when it finally came up, the in like every year that was. 16 or 15 16 we were it was unanimous with all the people that voted on the board not one person was a dissent which is like that's unbelievable of course oh, that's what they told us yeah right. who knows i wasn't there <laughs> <laughs> and i think you know for for me so it, it's it's interesting because you know in the in in music today as my dad had mentioned before, you know, right now country is very popular, rap, et cetera. Um, the genre of rock um, kind of goes, I don't want to say it's unforgotten, but it, it's not mainstream by way of what's most played on the radios today. So yeah. my, whether it's friends or, you know, my, I've got four young children, you know, they know who they call them grumpy. They know who, you know, grandpa <laughs> is. Um, and so when they start hearing that, right. So I think it was a couple things. One is, you know, we talked about the influences of, of, of bands that are, are really popular now with like Foo Fighters or with Pearl Jam, you know, th those people that listen to them, they'll hear references of Cheap Trick. Well, when you, you go to and you get inducted in the Hall of Fame now, be, you know, with, with mainstream media, with, with Instagram mm -hmm. and with Twitter and everything that is now social media, it gets a lot of, um, it, it gets a lot of, of exposure. Right. Yeah. And which then it, it's to me, it was kind of like something I knew that they were going to get in at some point, but it was almost like a stamp of, um, mm. you know, like right of not right of passage, but like just, you know, uh, uh, it was a long time coming and it's just kind of a, yeah. uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, okay, we got in before we were dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So it, it was one of the, like a, um, I don't know. It, it, it made it like legitimate almost like to mm. where now it's like, okay, more people understand the impact slash, you know, are getting the, the name cheap trick out there that maybe yeah. did no longer before. a principal. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. I still lie about that. <laughs> are you going to play some, play some uh, licks there, Rick? No, I just, Look I didn't show you this one. I got this one uh, just last week. It's, it was made in Italy. It's a it's an old pinball machine. It's oh wow! You know, even got the the plunger on the end. Oh. <laughs> and at night, it lights up. Oh, nice! That is it's awesome. Valley uh, valley machine. Is that one? That one's probably about as valuable as that Getty Lee guitar you just bought. Or that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just bought a few things. Well, I, I got a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you? I mean. You're still recording, Rick. I mean, what's... Yeah, we have another album coming up. You know, we never quit. Didn't matter yeah. how the record did. If it did great, we'd make records. If it didn't do great, we'd make records. <laughs> is, is there a song, I guess, one that, like, a lot of Cheap Trick fans are going to be watching this show. Is there a song of yours, like a deep cut song that you're really proud of that a lot of fans might not have heard that you either wrote or, or did? Uh, we just did a thing called, uh, it was the Nielsen Trust. It's Dax Nielsen, Miles Nielsen, Miles' wife, Kelly, and myself. We went on and played basically a bunch of deep, deeper cuts along with the, the, some of the hit stuff. It was like, it was kind of cool because the audience that came to see us was like, yeah, you know, they, they were into songs. So it's like, it didn't matter if we played it kind of a weird thing. I, I introduced one of the songs. I said, this should be a hit. And it's like, we played it. It's like, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> one was, it should have been a hit for a, uh, for a country band too. It's like, it should, there are a couple of them. It's like, you, if you just listen to them, it's like, you throw them in with the album and if the record doesn't do much, it's like, we've had two records that came out and uh, uh, Mo Austin, Lenny Warnaker was one of them. Our record, mm. uh, 
came out and they got fired right as it came out. Oh. I don't think it's because of us. So that went nowhere. Another one, we were on the Red Ant record. The record came out and two, three weeks later, they went out, went bankrupt. So in the meantime, you know, it's like, so there's one year and another year that's, that nobody thought we did anything. Yeah. yeah. No promotion. So, you know, we got 250 songs. I can't even name more than 10. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, Rick, I love the Christmas Christmas album you guys did a few years ago. I mean, that, it's, yeah. that that is. If anyone who's listening it hasn't checked, check that album out. It's got you guys yeah, got yeah. some original stuff on it, and you got some covers on it. And I, I just love that. I love, the, I love the old. I loved every track on that album. Well, there's something wrong with you. Really, <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun to do. It wasn't all that sappy. That's yeah. why I liked it. That, yeah. Yeah, that's why I liked it. Um, it was just, it was a very, fr- you know, because I get kind of, sometimes a couple years I'm like, yeah, I hear this song, yeah, but yeah, I mean, just hearing you, just the original stuff, what, Christmas, Christmas, uh, the last track, I love that. I love that song. Uh, I love the cover you guys did of Father Christmas by the Kinks. Yeah. Do, I like do, you approach, do you approach covers differently than recording your own stuff? Like, I mean, do you try and put different st- spin on them or how do you approach doing covers? We just do them the way we do. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I've played, I've done some uh, session work, you know, with Kiss, with uh, Motley Crue, with Hall and Oates, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. It's like, they want me for me. You know, they, if they want some guy to, to play it right every time, I'm not your guy. <laughs> do, do you have a favorite track, Aaron? Like a favorite Cheap Chick track or, or we're like... Let's see. What was the number one? See the most pop. Well, why you don't want me? And then we go to surrender, and then we go to dream. I put him through college. Then we, Thank you very much. <laughs> then, we go to the, then we go to the flame, and then we go. No. Uh, so you know, um, you know, there, there's songs that I like that they still play live. That you know, a lot of my friends, you know, we'll we'll sit around. Like last night, we were sitting around. It was my neighbor's birthday. And we were having, um, you know, some cigars, and and we put on cheap trick. Like so. Uh, like the, the song down, um, uh, you know, like Southern girls, um, come on, come on some songs that they'll play live that, you know, it's interesting too, because I don't think, and this is just my, per, my non-musical opinion, but I, I, I know what I like and what I don't like and what I hear. Mm. I think, um, that, you know, cheap trick, when you listen to their, their record is one thing, but then when you see them live, I think mm. you have a newfound appreciation because I know this too because when we'll go to you know live shows it's amazing the um amount of musicians that will will stay either to watch them or they'll they'll stay specifically or they'll come to specific, specifically see them like James Hetfield from Metallica you know he'll, mm. he came to 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 see Cheap Trick or you know uh what was her name um the she had her own reality show I'll, I'll think of it Jessica Simpson and her right. husband uh, Nick Lachey were up in Milwaukee. You know, you just have you know, random people that will mm. will stay around to watch because I think what what makes the band and why the longevity is they're good musicians and they sound well live. It's not this like yeah. over, over synthesized, you know, hair band with a bunch of fireworks and you know no musical talent whatsoever. You've got musicians that appreciate them for what they do and. Uh, the music that they put out and other musicians appreciate it versus, you know, whoever it may be. So you can see the craft behind it as opposed right. to just, the, right. yeah. yeah. A lot of people see us as like, no matter what, you know, we've made every mistake there is and we worked with everything and we've done, we just keep going. And I think mm. they like the work ethic of people. You know? It's, it's interesting because you're still recording now. It's and I was talking to Will about this before when we looked at, we we did a deep look at the Let It Bleed album from uh, Rolling Stones, and it's just interesting how music's consumed now. Like, like uh, instead of like looking getting albums like you're talking about getting Beatles records and listening to a record, it's it's just getting a song here, a song there, and as opposed to buying records, it's just an interesting change in how people listen to music. Well, I, you know, buying albums is like, I liked albums. That's what I, I grew up on albums. Yeah. It's stuff. And it's like, but I, I hated albums that were based on a, a single and then everything else is like 
trying to be that single, but just not as good. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Where it's now with uh, people buying stuff on on iTunes and listening on Spotify, it's very singles driven, with maybe filler around the album as opposed to a, a whole album, like thinking about where the tracks go in an album and stuff like that. No, well, attention span is so short. Mm. Yeah. Rip Not me. I have no. I have no patience. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, the Keep Your Kiss number one with the flame. Is it true that you didn't like that song at first? I thought uh, I read that. Is that true or false? Yes, but it, not for the same reason that everybody's, you know. Okay. Whatever. It's like that was about the tenth uh, song that was brought to us by the producer and the record company, and it's like hey, this is the one. This is going to be great, and then we do a demo. Of it, and then uh, yeah, whatever, and then the next one. There were ten in a row. By that time, it's like, you know, it's like I couldn't tell a, a good one from a bad one almost. And mm. and the guy that we were working with, uh, I said, this sounds like nature's way at the beginning. And the producer, Richie Zito, who played with uh, Neil Sadaka, and he also yep. played with uh, Elton John, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. He knew every song in every key. He says, oh, I'd never heard of that one. Oh, brother. <laughs> it just infuriated me. <laughs> so, hey, Pop, I think. Great job, and I tried to do a good job, too. So, Pop, I think, um, you know, Dave, you were asking about, you know, or you are telling that story about, um, you know, the, the, the flame and kind of the, the tenth one they brought to you. I think it's a good story, and I was talking to, to Will about this briefly, about um, I Want You to Want Me wasn't even going to be played at Budokan. All right. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, that's the story that I was told. That's the story I was told, or at least that Tom tells me. Oh, did Tom tell you that? Because he yeah. heard it from Robin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the exact details, of it, but, uh, you know, it had been a hit in Japan, mm. even the crummy stu uh, studio version. So, you know, whatever you heard is correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's uh, and then like I said, you know, like you know, those songs like they just uh, you know, I want you to want me. I mean, you it's two years later it comes out and if you know gives you a hit there, it's 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 got to be a great feeling, you know. Still play it every night. Yeah, oh. <laughs> makes people happy. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely, it's true. Actually, you know the chords to it. Oh, there you go. So many people have done that and put it in in movies and TV shows. It's like all the time. And it's like, I kind of wish somebody would make it a hit. <laughs> How, what do you think about that song connects with people? Why, why do you think? It's simple. And it's like, uh, I said, I wish I could be that stupid more often. <laughs> I want you to want me, duh. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, like everybody kind of knows it. And yeah. You just, if you, uh, I just did a, a guitar lesson on Instagram of Surrender because everybody played it wrong. You know, <laughs> they did. They always played the wrong chords. It's like, so I finally taught everybody. It's like, you know, I had the guys in Pearl Jam don't know it, Slash doesn't know it, all these guys. <laughs> You know, they could all, you know, beat me on uh, their technique and uh, skills. But uh, but I'm a songwriter, not a guitar player. If we wanted a real good guitar, I'd hire Eddie Van Halen or Jeff Beck. <laughs> yeah. But I do the best I can. So, so what's your sort of writing process like? Like, where do you find, are you just writing well, all the time? You have or? to not be talking to anybody, so see you later. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Dave. <laughs> My voice is kind of shot here. Oh, that's. I hate talking about like, myself. Uh, Aaron? <laughs> Aaron, you look great. You look like a uh, cover of Queen album. The what? Queen album. With the, oh, yeah. yeah. You do have a very Queen sort of uh, cover album look to you. <laughs> Freddie Mercury. Uh oh. So, so Aaron, we'll get to the cigar bit then. Uh, what, like, what is. Some of the like, what are your cigars? You're smoke. I mean, you're smoking the Byron today. What are some of your favorites you go to? Yeah, so I guess 
you know, I was, I, I saw Will had put out, it was a conversation recently about the, the La Aurora, the, the, the Anos, I think I'm pronouncing it right. The San Anos. Yeah. The, your, your kind of Mount Rushmore. So I would say probably the 80th Padron. Um, if I have right. you know, one, one cigar to go to is probably the 80th. Um, the whole reserve family is great. Um, I, I like a lot of the stuff that, um, kind of comes out from what used to be kind of the Dura State lineage, if you will. So the, so with Nick Melillo, with Saka stuff, um, more so than anything, I, I think I've, I'm starting to gravitate towards some of the more we'll call boutique or smaller batch stuff. I think there's, they've got more complexity. Um, I like kind of that dessert flavor, the, 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 the cream, the coffee, the cocoa, um, you know, stuff with a little more body. I, I'm not a Connecticut smoker. Um, so for me, it's, it's, um, I think there's a lot more nuances in some of the smaller stuff, but you know, if I'm going to go to, uh, like, you know, it's my, my desert Island cigar, I'll probably go the, the 80th. If I can stomach more than more than one in a, in a sitting, <laughs> that's a pretty strong cigar, but uh, you know, I'll smoke those. I, I don't smoke Cubans very often. You know, my, like we talked about before, my dad will bring some back from, from Canada or from when he goes to UK or Italy or whatever. Um, and I'll smoke those, you know, from time to time, but the consistency of a Cuban cigar you know, if you yeah. get a box of Cubans, you're, you know, maybe you're hoping half maybe are, are smokable where you're not uh, getting something plugged or, you know, they're unwrapping and, and whatever. So it will send some to me. Let me judge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of what I go to. I mean, um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's funny when you somebody will see a smoke and they're like, hey, is that a Cuban? I just I, I got tired of, you know, correcting them. No, you know, Nicaraguan or Honduran. I, I just say yes. You know, it's a, it's a Cuban. <laughs> sure. But, you know, to me, it doesn't matter about, about price. Yeah, I'm smoking a, a Byron right now because I'll break out, you know, some, some of the more higher end, quote unquote, from a price standpoint. But I get as much enjoyment of like a, a Rocky Patel, the, the head, the edge Habano. I mean, I can, you know, you can pick up that stick for four or five bucks. To me, it smokes great. Um, it's got great flavor. And if I, I don't have to pay attention to it, it's good by me. But, you know, there'll be nights after a long day of work or whatever, and I'm by myself. I'll smoke something that, that um, where I can pay attention to that I appreciate more than you know, mowing the lawn and, and chucking it yeah. golf. And I'll take, I, I played golf yesterday. I don't, I don't take a Byron on the golf course. You know, it's going to be no. something different. You know how good Aaron is at golf? Oh, <laughs> uh, yep. He was on the mini tour, the PGA tour for two years. Yeah, he was telling me that. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Once I started playing with Tiger and those guys, I realized that uh, maybe I should get into another uh, line of work. <laughs> 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 I lived in Orlando for four years and um, yeah, it was a good experience. It was one of those things that I had to discuss with my dad about it, you know, when I was getting ready to turn pro and it's like, you know, I didn't want to be sitting at age 35 or whatever take your pick and saying, you know, God, I wish I would have done that. You know, I look back and I don't have any regrets about it, but those guys are good. You know, when you see that commercial and that, you know, that says these guys are good, these guys are really good. <laughs> They're mm. really good. And so I was good, but not good enough, but uh, <laughs> it all worked out. That's one thing, Aaron, uh, I'll keep, I'll give you a cigar to keep your eye on for this year. Ooh. Okay. Um, you, and it's i uh, I've already smoked it. It's not out yet. Uh, Aladino Cameroon. Ooh, so I, I yeah. So the whole I, I know you're a big fan, Will, of the yeah. the Aladino line from the yeah. from that. So I I've got the um uh you know the Corojo, um I've got I think it's the Maduro, the Natural. So um I love their whole line. Um, you know it's hard to find good Cameroons. Um, you know depending on you know who, who's going to ma manufacture. Yeah. So I will definitely keep an eye out for I'll it. I'll give you a secret. It's not it's not um Cameroon. It's actually a, a Cameroon seed grown in Honduras. Oh. So, and it's, so it's a little different is where it's going to get at, but it, it is, I mean, you know, I've been high on the line. Yeah. It, it, this one's, this one's another like big hit they're going to have uh, when this, it's, it's coming out like in the next few weeks, they're going to start soft launching it. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I was with, I was with Husto Aroa and uh, back in February and he gave me a couple of these and I'm like, holy cow. How long did you let him rest for? Um, I actually smoked one that day and I let the other one rest for about six weeks and both smoked consistent. He had those, I think already aging at the office. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I was, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm knowing not impressed with a cigar 
when it first hits the store shelf. But so, right. but yeah, I, I was very impressed with that cigar. You got uh, you got two Hall of Famers on here, and you got a Hall of Fame for rock and roll and a Hall of Fame in the cigar industry and Will Cooper. It's no, like stop. A, no, no, no. Coop is, my no. dad was on uh, Dan Rather not long ago. He's like, Coop's like the Dan Rather of cigars over here. And he, he, you know? <laughs> I was called – who was I called? Uh, Roy, I was called Roy Firestone once because I made, someone, I made someone cry. I was going to say, you didn't, uh, my dad and I aren't crying yet, so that's a guy, no, isn't it? I made Sam Lucia <laughs> cry. I made Sam Lucia cry in the interview because we grilled him pretty hard. <laughs> I I told, oh, look I, at you. I told you I talked to Sam um, a couple weeks ago. Really nice guy. He, he really is. He really is. Yeah. So he's, uh, he's, uh, he's still – I was telling you the whole thing. He's now up in Pittsburgh, and he's doing yep. the Stogie Bird thing. So he's – Doing some, I think he's doing some COVID kind of now promotions too, where he's some things are going to help COVID. He's putting a mask in there, I think something like that. Hey, good for him. Yeah, yeah. I think my dad's got the cops at his house or something. Look, he's got lights. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look out! Yeah. The uh, but Aaron, how did you actually get started smoking cigars? Yeah, it's great. So you know, it's interesting because my dad won't probably remember this, but so. At our house, he didn't really have a humidor, but he had, I don't think it was, it was actually like um, the best humidification systems, if you will, of, of cigars, but <laughs> there you go. Oh, the cheap, cheap trick uh, mask there. Oh, look at that. Um, and so my dad had, had cigars laying around, and I, every once in a while I would like act like I was smoking it and whatever. And, you know, I think it was more recreational, especially when you're playing golf, you know, with your buddies, you'll, you'll fire up a cigar, they're a wedding and whatever. And, uh, about four years ago, um, when I stopped drinking, um, I really got into cigars. Uh, my, my father-in-law, um, he's a big cigar smoker and, um, for my birthdays would give me like a, you know, one of those like Thompson samplers, the big, where you get like 50 right. cigars or whatever it may be. And so I was just sampling stuff and I just became like hooked on it um, just because it, it, it reminds me of, um, as you guys probably know, it reminds me of, um, uh, you know, people that are big into wine, you know, you know, regions and, and vintages, et cetera. And I just started kind of falling in love with the idea of getting to know as much as I could along with enjoying cigars. And so for me right now, um, I heard the, um, I heard that interview with Jonathan Drew and he was talking about the barbershop. Um, you know, that was where people would go to kind of talk and they would, they would socialize and talk about, you know, world and their problems or, you know, their wife or husband or whatever it may be. And I think the, the cigar lounge has, has kind of really become that. And for me, it's a great way to meet people. It's a way that I can use as a kind of a, a social component and, you know, along with smoking on the golf course as well. So it's been, you know, I don't know, my, my knowledge is very limited. I know what I like. I like my dad with He's talking about music. I mean, I know what I like. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, you know, being only really four years into really being passionate about it. For me, it's always about trying new stuff. And then, so I'll, you know, go try to get sampler or five packs of this or five packs of this when I see kind of a, what's out there and trial and error. Beautiful. That mask was something, Rick. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> cool. There you go. You're longer going to be a, sequestered you gotta look cool you, you always That's look cool right. you always look cool you always look cool well, guys i'm gonna take off here yeah well thanks Rick. we want to thank time. you for the opportunity we really appreciate it you taking the time and uh thank you so much for sharing some time with us today we do appreciate it well, i hope you don't get banned from the air because of this this uh, <laughs> pandemic uh, uh interview not at all not at all not at all. Rick, uh, uh, best of luck to you. Uh, stay healthy, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, with new music and on the road again. Uh, thank you, and uh, good luck in Brisbane. And uh, didn't I say something about send me some, so let me judge? <laughs> yeah. There you go, cool. Yeah, there you go. We'll, we'll do right. that. We can do that. All right, guys. Hey, I'll Aaron. talk with Aaron. Hey, Pop. He's a good-looking man, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sure is. He's after the mother. Bye-bye. <laughs> Uh, take care rick that is the one and only rick nielsen uh of chief trick aaron we, we really want to thank you on that as well yeah my pleasure so i'm glad uh you know he's um he's got more stories sometimes but he's got the he, he's fully admitted that he's got the attention span of about a gnat so to keep him here, 
No, we 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 were we actually went longer than probably we planned. So we do oh, appreciate. No, uh, yeah, it, um, you know he's got a short attention span, which, you know, ironically he's in the house by himself. My mom's in Arizona because she she went out there for vacation and then has stayed out there this whole time. So he's he's at home by himself. He's got nothing else going on. So the fact that, you know, he's got to run. I don't know. Probably go take a nap or something. But you know, to keep him. He, he doesn't have a long attention span, so I'm glad he got to spend a little time with you guys. No, we're honored. Like I said, uh, we would have been like, totally happy even talking to you. You know, so it's uh, it was a great bonus and a great opportunity for us, and we're very grateful for that. Well, I love um, your guys' show. You know, as I talk to you guys, um, you know, um, what you guys do not only for the cigar industry, but you know, kind of combining that with with the musical component with the jukebox, I think it um, you know goes a long way to just broaden people's exposure to different things and mm-hmm. huge fans of you guys. And um, I'm glad that, you know, you guys allowed me this opportunity to come on and kind of rap a little bit. Yeah. We'd love to have oh, yeah. you back too. Um, don't, you know, we, we do a lot of shows and I think we, I, think I, I could speak for Dave. I think we'd love to have you back. You know, so. Oh yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. Talk yeah, music, anytime. talk cigars. <laughs> cigars. I know a lot more about than music. As you guys know, I mean, I'm not a, as I, as I talked before, I'm not a, you know, a music guy. It's, it's funny because, my brothers, so my dad didn't really talk about, he doesn't like to talk about himself a lot. Um, mm. my, my brother, Miles, is a musician, singer, songwriter. So that's what he does for a living. And then, you know, I know you guys were going to get into it, but, you know, they kicked Bunny out of the band about 10 years ago. And mm. my brother, Dax, who's my younger brother, he's the drummer of Cheap Trick now. So I've got a lineage of siblings that are, are music buffs, if you will, or, or talented. I've got no musical ability whatsoever. So... For me, music has always been part of my life, but it's not something mm. that, um, you know, I know really how to play. I mean, it's completely foreign to me to pick up a guitar. So I'm not the best to, you know, from, a, you know, experiences playing with people like my brothers have and this and that, whereas I'm just more, um, I'm kind of the black sheep of the family, really, <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. Uh, not, but yeah, you, you but you like music, and that's kind of what we yeah. do. Is you know, Dave and I don't I, I don't come from a musical background. I come from a music like fan background in doing right. this show. You know, right. so um, oh yeah, yeah. So there's like and Dave like this is Dave's concept. Dave created this concept about six years ago, uh, and I was lucky enough he reached out to me on my old podcast and just wanted to collaborate. And one thing led to another, and we we've been you know we've known each other since then. And, um, you know, when, when it was time to kind of sunset jukebox, I said, Dave, can we look at another Avenue to keep this alive? Because, uh, he had built a great following here. So when you guys, so Dave, you, you clearly know your music and, and musical background. Um, well, Hey, look, coming from me, I mean, pretty much everybody does, but it sounds like, you know, you've got your, your music knowledge. So what, what, what are your kind of genre? Are you, you know, from that 70s rock are you more so are you across the board or i'm kind of across the board i mean like you i think the the, the only musical thing i play is the record player i don't play any other yeah. <laughs> any instruments but i just love and sort of like with your dad and with cheap trick with music in general what i really like about it is how you can put a record out and you have these songs that for you are personal and they're written about whatever but you put them out and you can have a song um, that speaks to millions of people with totally different experience. That's right. But it's this like singular thing. Right. Um, which I really love about music. So I'm just sort of across the board from like, you know, Pavarotti to Motown to 70s oh. rock to stuff coming out now. And Well, it's interesting, you know, you bring up, you bring up the music and kind of the, the binding of, of, of people, um, mm. you know, it's what cigars does in a lot of ways. I mean, if you think about, you know, you, you'll sit down in a lounge and you'll have people that are blue collar, white collar, CEO, lawyers, whatever it may be, but you all have that, you can all spend an hour and have something in common. And oh, yeah. music, music kind of can, can, is that kind of gateway to conversation, friendship, whatever it may be to where you can get on the same page with somebody. And it's the same thing that, that, draws me to the again that the cigar lifestyle if you will well yeah with cigars too what i love about music and i guess where it fits in and why i love doing the show with coop is like with cigars like you're saying like you'll get these samplers and you're like oh i've never heard of this brand this cigar is amazing and it's the same thing as like when i was looking getting ready for this i watched some old interviews with your dad um 
and he was talking about a record from the 70s uh, by a band called The Move. And I'm like, oh, I got to check this band out. And I checked yep. them out. I'm like, this band's great. <laughs> you know, they recorded it in the set. I've never heard of them. And it's sort of like music's the same thing. You can always uncover like new stuff you haven't heard of. And, and cigars is the same way. You can hear a brand and, and, you know, you're always sort of uncovering new things. Well, it's funny. So my dad can claim that that I want you to want me story was kind of like not really where you heard it. Go back and watch. They did a documentary and they talked about that story in the documentary. So he wants to spin it different ways. And that like, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, that's truly what happened. I mean, they were trying to figure out the set list and the time. And if you listen to the, I want you to want me from the record sounds completely mm. different than it yeah. does live. And yeah. when they put it live, that's when it became really popular. I mean, it was a little bit popular in Japan, as you mentioned, but when they did it live, that resonated with people in the States and around the world. Mm. Oh yeah, no, it's, um, I just like, like music and cigars is just like you're saying, like there's nothing better than to sit down with a couple of people, put on a record, have a cigar. It's just great. Absolutely. Oh, Will, you got. Just why your dad yeah. actually was working behind the oh, scenes. Oh, look at that. There it is. The yep, Todd so, Brungan, yeah. Yep. So that's the picture that is in. So oh. he's got down our basement um, where the guitars are, down in my, my parents' basement. He's got his gold albums. He's got all his albums um, all over the place. But um, he's also got a wall of pictures of himself, you know, Gene Simmons and, and Debbie Harry and, you know, just all kinds of people. And one of the pictures is that picture um, on the wall. So that's the one I was referencing. That's awesome. Look at that. Oh, it's, it's, oh, and it's just, in talking to your dad and listening to you telling stories, it's also really crazy how, like, he had these connections with people over so many different musical genres as well. That's like right. He started off the show talking about meeting Dolly Parton, and then he's talking about ACDC and Todd Rundgren, and it's crazy. You know, the, the interesting or crazy part about it is, I mean, he's, and it's only in the last probably 10 years I started hearing more and more stories, but I mean, he knows everybody, and everybody knows him. Part of it is because of his shtick, right? He wears a baseball hat. I mean, he's kind of yeah. recognizable. It's not like, you know, somebody else that that is doesn't have a, a persona by him, if you will, but everybody knows him. Um, and therefore, and they know the music, they know a couple songs or whatever, musicians always coming up. And so he's got, um, you know, he's, he's met and knows pretty much everybody in the industry for being around for so long. And it's funny because we didn't talk about it with him this time, but, you know, he talks about now the fact that, you know, they were on American Pickers or he was that show American Pickers, those guys out of Nashville. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, they produce it and they, they, they had, the producer flew out to Rockford, couple weeks before and they kind of knew what they were going to go through but he said as many people recognize him now from american pickers as they do from being in cheap trick oh yeah they're so popular and you know he donated some stuff down to those guys and there's some stuff in their store in nashville of of my dad but um yeah you know he's he's met everybody in all walks of you know i was like i said i was talking to david wells yesterday or two days ago um you know baseball player or you know you get yeah. musicians you get uh, you know, actors and actresses and stuff that you get to, to meet. It's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's that power of music, isn't it? Just to, that, yeah, yeah. that connection. Well, it's funny because you always hear the stories like musicians want to be athletes and athletes want to be musicians. Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah, like one yeah. of those things where I couldn't be either. So <laughs> yeah, I, wasn't I don't know if golf is really a sport, so I don't know. Well, that's debatable on my part, but I can't um, do it. So, <laughs> but uh um, so, you know, people come up and want to, you know, me, I mean, they know about his guitar collection. Cause that's, you know, obviously very famous and, you know, it was on YouTube recently where he bought that guitar on auction down Orlando, um, out of the Getty Lee collection. And, you know, people send me stuff like that. And he was on Howard Stern because you were talking about the, the, uh, rock and roll hall of fame. Um, Howard was playing over the, the, um, the COVID, you know, replays and reruns. Mm -hmm. Howard Stern is a huge cheap trick fan. And, um, you know, he, they put one of his song, uh, I think it was surrender was on private parts. And right. in fact, if you go back and look at the interview, uh, that my dad did on Howard Stern, I think in 16, when they were getting ready to go to hall of fame, um, they pulled my mom, my mom goes in the studio and talks about how, how her dad mm -hmm. did not want 
her to marry my dad, you know, and oh. that whole, that whole story too. So <laughs> I got to check that out now. It's a pretty oh, funny yeah. interview. It's like, oh. did, so Howard's to my mom's like, so uh, did your dad like Rick? No. Did you want him? Did he want you to marry him? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out, I guess, at the end. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's oh, no, we got to have you back on, Aaron, to do a Pearl Jam show. Yeah, this, uh, I think I think that's, uh, yeah, if you would do that, Aaron, we'd love it. I would love to. And, in fact, I'll uh, I'll get – I'll see if I can get Eddie or I'll get McCready, one of those guys. I'll wow. Get get, I'll text Mike. He's a little more – he is obsessed with my dad. And I mean that in a good way, right? So right. he is the biggest – so my dad actually played his 50th birthday party in Seattle. His wife surprised Mike. And had Cheap Trick come play for Mike's um, 50th surprise birthday party. So um, there's, there's, I got tons of pictures with myself and Eddie and, and Mike. They're great guys. And if, if I have enough um, notice, I'll get see if Mike can join us. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. well, I mean, Pearl Jam and Eddie, it's sort of like your dad, too. And the Eddie's done – they've done tons of stuff. Like from work, the album with Neil Young to Eddie's done music – like movie scores so they just they just put out another album like they have done tons of stuff so so coop you're a baseball guy so um in fact my brother dax who's now the drummer for cheap trick um theo epstein does the hot stove every year so he did it in boston and then when theo came to chicago he moved the same hot uh hot stove uh charity event and so dax was eddie's drummer if wow or, and so theo you know was up so the cubs were there and i got to meet the cubs team but i was back with eddie because Dax was the drummer for the hot stove event. And so got to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Eddie there because Dax um, is such a great drummer. Um, Eddie wanted Dax to play with him in Chicago. So, you know, just there's, there's connections there, um, you know, with those guys as well, with not only myself, but my, my younger brother. When, when, oh, we, yeah. when I visited Davidoff a few years ago, uh, I was in Hanky Kellner's office. He's the master blender. Mm -hmm. And he had – some he had like he had a couple of gifts he was given from the cubs they were actually the whole cubs team or, or a good number of the cubs team actually went down to the davidoff factory a few weeks before we were there wow so yeah they were really into it yeah they got to go down there and uh hanky kellner is actually a big baseball fan um too in the, in the dominican we found out uh yeah, Bear I, like, I, I like the uh, uh the straight it's a straight jacket isn't it that he does the um what's a the smoking jacket. He does the smoking yeah. jacket. The smoking jacket's his son. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's cool. Hendrick. Yeah, that's yeah. his son. He's got that. Uh, he's got both of those. I like the uh, the small. I don't know. It's the, I don't know if it's a private blend, but the the other. Uh, that's a really good cigar. But I know who Hanky. I know who. Uh, yeah. Is from yeah. Him. I mean, both Hendrick and 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 Klaus are real. The next generation of that. The Kellners are going to be in very good shape, as well as uh, mm. Hanky's daughter Monica, who's a uh, grower. Um, oh really. Right. Yeah, she and she grow. She grew tobacco that's in one of the saga. It's it's actually in the short tails number two, okay. uh, which is also another really good cigar. So I got to meet her uh, in February, uh, and she's a wealth of knowledge as well. And she's married to Augusto Reyes, who is the head oh, of the yeah. Reyes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. Well, so. I was out. Um, I I mentioned to you briefly. I was out in um, Scottsdale at the Ambassador Cigar Lounge and. Um, Saka was getting ready to come out there, but Pete Johnson, they, I don't know if he was passing by where, but they were, he was talking about how, you know, he's married to, uh, Garcia, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yanni. He, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, there's that connection there and Pete, you know, I, I gone back and forth with Pete a little bit because Pete's a musician too. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you got that connection that I was telling you, John Huber, big music guy yep. and, um, big cheap trick fan. So, you know, there's, it, it's weird how you kind of run in the circle keeps kind of getting smaller and smaller or bigger and bigger either way, whichever way you look at it, which is people in the multiple industries that have that tie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Ernesto Perez Correa Jr. was a drummer. Michael Herklotz was a drummer. So yeah. uh, Abe Flores, uh, who runs PDR Cigars, just put out an album. Oh, Nick really? Perdomo. Nick Perdomo. Oh, Nick Perdomo. How can, Nick, yeah, I can't forget Nick. Um, he plays every year at the trade show. Uh, he brings a big drum set. He brings his drum set there. And at 430 every day, uh, Nick's on the drums doing a solo. Well, that's like, uh, that's like, um, 
So Nick Melillo with Foundation Cigars and stuff, and I think you mentioned Foundation earlier. Mm-hmm. Like he knows uh, Ziggy Marley and all this stuff because he's a yeah, big yeah. reggae guy. So I met uh, so he, Ziggy. I met Ziggy. My dad knows him. Um, I met Ziggy. Um, it was at Alpine Valley, which is up in Wisconsin. It's a big outdoor yeah. amphitheater there. So it was Ziggy Marley opened up for Cheap Trick, and Cheap Trick opened up for In Excess. If you remember, oh, 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 oh that's my yeah. favorite band. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. Uh, Michael Hutchinson. So we, I got to meet those guys, but Z, it was Ziggy and then Cheap Trick and then In Excess. And, so, uh, and then, so that was one of the times too. So In Excess, all those guys sat and watched Cheap Trick play before they went on. And then if you oh. remember the song, so off of Lap of Luxury, um, Let It Go was, I think it got really high in the charts in Australia. Yes. Yeah. Um, at yeah. the time with that whole album and, you know, in excess were huge cheap trick fans. And so I was with Michael Hutchinson um, on the side. I was younger. I was probably 16, 17 years old up and up 30 years ago, up in Alpine Valley, mm. to meet those guys. Yeah. Wow. But no, Aaron, we'll, we'll, we got, we got, we'll write it in. You're coming on for a Pearl Jam show. That is, yeah, yeah. Well, even if you can't get them, Aaron, don't worry about it. We could, yeah, you know, talk Pearl Jam with you, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I'll, we, I'll, you know, do my, I'll do my best. Yeah. Yeah, we want you to stay a friend of the show, a friend of us personally. Um, we, like I said, we're grateful. Um, I'm grateful to meet you as well as your dad. Um, I'm honored. Yeah, same here. Same here. Um, but uh, Dave, you have anything else? No, just wanted to thank Aaron and. Uh, and you, and you and everybody for, for setting this up um, just to get an hour of talking music and everything was great. I mean, it's a, yeah. you know, it's amazing. Yep. Uh, absolutely. Um, what we should do, Dave and Aaron, can you stay on when yeah. we, when we start the show? Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause I want to, I want to ask you one other thing. Um, so Dave, I think we should talk about what we have coming up next, next week, actually. Right. Oh yes. We've got on oh, you. You you'll be interested in this, Aaron. You'll have to vote. So we're doing a battle of the bands, NCAA tournament style. Awesome. And uh, and uh, I mean I, I mean yeah. Unfortunately for your for your dad in the in the bracket, he goes up against Led Zeppelin in the oh. first round. So I don't know how I don't know how that'll. Go. I have not. That's Dave's bracket, by the way. I had nothing to do with that seating. <laughs> what seating did they get? They must have got like a 16 seed. They're going to one against 16, which is they got they oh. got a fifth. They got a 15. Oh, yeah. that was Dave's call. <laughs> it's tough. Who are it's the tough. other? Who are the other two seeds that they could have gone up? Anybody easier than Led Zeppelin? I had the Police uh, as my two seed, and then yeah. the Rolling Stones were my one. I got Beatles were my one. I got uh, Aretha Franklin. I think is a three, um, and uh, I think Bob Marley was a four. So you, it's, a t- it's a tough bracket, Aaron. That's a very tough bracket. You should, you know, next time if I, I'll, I don't know if he'll how long he'll commit for, but I was telling Coop, my dad was, um, he's with Sting all the time now. Um, yeah. They're, they're close friends all of a sudden. And, and my dad's idol, who he would probably, if he had, we would have talked about is Jeff Beck. And yes. so my mom passed out at dinner. It was my mom and my dad and Jeff Beck at Thanksgiving dinner this last year. <laughs> my mom passes out at dinner. At, she, not from drinking, I, you know, <laughs> jet lag or whatever the hell it was. Um, yeah, so she's passing out with Jeff Beck. My dad's like, great. You know, I'm here. I'm having dinner with my idol, and my wife is passed out at <laughs> <laughs> dinner. Oh, uh, awesome. Jeff Beck, man. Yeah, because wow, he's got yeah. a lot of time. He's done tons of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, but on Twitter, so on Coop's Twitter, um, we're going to have polls up for each round. And then depending on the poll, they'll uh, – the, the winner will go on like NCAA style, and then we're going to have a championship, the winner of my division versus the winner of Coop's division. Then we're going to have a show on who wins the championship. Yep. All right. Yep. So, so that, we'll, that's, we'll be checking that out for sure. And we're going to be picking, like, bands every year. We may bring some back and, you know, we bring some new ones. And so we'll see. And we didn't get Pearl Jam in there. That's a surprise. Yeah, well, how, you know, you've got to have a line somewhere. Yep. Is ACDC yep. your one seed? They are mine. I think there's six on mine. Now are you, but you're, are you pre? Your uh, ACDC is tough too because you have fans of sort of the 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 older and the the newer. Right. Well, it's you like Van gets... Halen, right? Like, are you? Yeah. Are you David Lee Roth? Are you Sammy? Are you? you know... Van Halen's a Van Halen's actually on my on my side too. Yeah, I just counted the band as a whole. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, but you could you could check out Coop's Twitter and, and vote. Have a vote in there. 
Yeah. I'll have my family. I'll have all my friends and family on online voting nonstop for, for take down Led, take Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I don't, think that'll, I don't think that'll work, but I won't. Yeah, exactly. Um, Did you want me to hang on? Cause you guys are doing the intro or where I want to just ask you one thing offline. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, and then just want to mention one thing next, the next show, Dave is uh, the episode 10, the John Prine show. Yeah, we're going to talk John Prine with Skip Martin from Roma That's Craft. next week. We're doing that next week, right? Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah, we'll have Skip on from Roma Craft and uh, John Prine. I'm sure he's going to be busting my balls the whole show. So, stay tuned for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, that's going to wrap up. Uh, we want to thank again uh, Aaron and his dad, Rick, uh, for being very generous with their time tonight. Um, thanks to you, Dave, as well. And thanks to our audience. And that's going to wrap up Primetime Jukebox Episode 9 into the Annals of History. Um, stay tuned for Battle of the Bands and Episode 10. Have a great night, everybody.